This panel is going to make an important contribution because panelists here have significant empirical research, which many of them are going to bring to bear on this topic of compensation, risk, and leverage. We're going to begin with Brandon Rees, who is not actually an empirical researcher, uh, in the general sense of that term at least, but is rather the deputy director of the AFL-CIO's Office of Investment, and he's going to explain the policy position that they've been taking with Congress and with regulators. Brandon, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. So as, as uh, John explained, I'm not a academic, I'm a practitioner, and I want to share with you today um, our perspective as a, both an institutional investor as well as an advocate for corporate governance reform. Uh, my goals are to describe uh, both our experience and thoughts on executive compensation, leverage, and the financial crisis. First, I'll describe briefly uh, uh, what, uh, what we do and, um, and then uh, talk about uh, Bear Stearns as, as, and what the experience there for investors uh, that prompted the, the U.S. financial crisis. The AFL-CI is the largest federation of trade unions in the United States. Uh, we have 11 and a half million members. Uh, our, our workers generally and our members are major shareholders of publicly traded companies through their retirement savings. Uh, there's over seven and a half trillion dollars in total U.S. retirement plan assets and union-sponsored plans make up 480 billion of that amount. The Office of Investment uh, where I work uh, at the AFL-CIO, provides research and assistance in support of corporate governance initiatives by union members' pension plans. Our goal is to enhance the retirement security of union members and workers generally by encouraging greater corporate accountability. Union-sponsored plans are leading advocates of governance reform. Uh, every proxy season, union-sponsored plans submit hundreds of shareholder resolutions. We also lead vote no campaigns against directors that we believe have underperformed and executive pay packages that we believe are excessive and promote excessive risk. We also lobby for imp improved regulatory oversight to protect shareholders. Most of our governance work is focused on executive compensation reform. In 1997, we created the AFL-CIO's Executive Pay Watch website to inform our members about trends in CEO pay and what should be done about it. This CEO pay database is the most popular section of the AFL-CIO's website. We strongly support a say on pay, an advisory vote on executive compensation that's included in the financial reform legislation now pending before Congress. Uh, we also support majority voting for director elections and equal access to the proxy to nominate directors. These measures will make boards more responsive to shareholders on executive pay. As employee stakeholders of corporations, we're concerned that runaway CEO pay has exacerbated economic inequality, but more importantly, as shareholders, through our pension plans, we believe that compensation incentives have encouraged executives to make very bad decisions that harm long-term value. In our view, executive compensation is the mechanism by which CEOs have become captive to short-term market forces. It is the incentive structure that guides executive decision-making, and these compensation incentives motivate executives to choose between long-term strategies that create value or short-term approaches. Over the past 10 years, stock market investors have suffered the worst decade since the Great Depression. During this lo last decade, stock prices declined 24% as measured by the S&P 500 index. We've suffered the collapse of the technology bubble, the corporate accounting scandals, and now the financial crisis. Meanwhile, CEOs have received some of the fattest paychecks in history. In 1980, the average CEO of an S&P 500 company made approximately 40 times the average worker's compensation. By 1990, that ratio had grown to over 100 times. In 2000, CEO pay peaked at over 500 times average worker pay and it has now only fallen to about 300 to 1 today. Shareholders have long demanded pay for performance and we believe that incentives do matter. But based on our conversations with director comp uh, board of director compensation committees, we believe that corporate directors have not fully appreciated how the incentives that they give executives can differ from the interests of long-term shareholders. In our view, boards have not adequately adjusted compensation packages for risk. Too often, compensation programs encourage corporate executives to maximize short-term financial gains at the expense of long-term sustainability. Large golden parachutes further insulate CEOs from the financial risk of catastrophic results. 
For example, stock option grants can, can encourage excessive risk taking by CEOs to maximize their potential gains through short term stock price increases. Stock options promise executives all the benefit of share price increases with none of the risk of share price declines. In other words, stock options provide asymmetric incentives to shoot for the moon. As measured by the Black-Scholes option pricing model, one way to increase the value of your stock options is to increase the share price volatility of your company. The more volatile the stock, the more likely you're able to exercise your options. And employing leverage is a good way to amplify the potential gain or loss of your company's investments. As we see it, boards have overused individual performance metrics to set compensation levels without adequately adjusting for risk. In particular, the use of return on equity to set pay levels has encouraged executives to use increased financial leverage. Bear Stearns provides a dramatic example. In the years leading up to the financial crisis, Bear Stearns Compensation Committee selected just one metric to determine the formula used to calculate its executives' bonus pool. Shareholders had approved nine different performance metrics that could have been used, but the board only used one, return on equity. There are two ways to increase a company's return on equity. First, executives can increase the company's net income. That's presumably what the board intended. But the other way is to decrease the amount of shareholders' equity employed. In other words, use more debt financing relative to equity financing. In 2006 was the last year that Bear Stearns awarded its top executives a bonus. In 2006, return in equity increased to 19.1%, up from 16.5% in the prior year. While earnings increased, the debt to equity ratio also increased to an astounding 32 times to one. As a result, top Bear Stearns executives received $140 million cash and stock bonus pool. Earlier this month, Bear Stearns CEO, James Kane, he testified before Congress that, quote, in retrospect, in hindsight, I would say that leverage was too high. But he denied that his compensation formula had led him to take on too much debt. We believe that this might be because he was too busy selling his shares of stock. As Professor Lucian Bebchek's recent work has documented, the top executives at Bear Stearns cashed out over a billion dollars in equity between 2000 and 2008, far more than they held when the company collapsed. This highlights another failure of compensation committees, the failure to impose meaningful stockholding requirements on executives. There's an obvious tension between shareholders and executives about how much of their net wealth should be tied up in the company's stock. CEOs would like to diversify their portfolios, and as many bankers complained under the TARP compensation limits, they would also like to spend this compensation on their second and third homes, for example. In contrast, shareholders want executives to be subject to meaningful stock lockup periods. From my point of view, all shares granted after taxes should have to be held for as long as the rule against perpetuities will allow. I would like to see the CEO's grandchildren be required to hold the, sh the stock as shareholders. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. In summary, this is our message to compensation committees. Don't rely on one performance metric that can be gamed and adjust pay for performance to account for risk. Pay executives with actual shares of stock for meeting those performance metrics and make them hold the stock for a substantial period of time thereafter. Most importantly, we need compensation systems that focus executives on long-term value creation. The business decisions that today's CEOs make impact shareholder value for decades to come. These decisions will also determine whether companies provide good jobs, make high-quality products, and protect the environment. In the long run, we believe the interest of shareholders, employees, and other stakeholders of the corporation converge around the goal of creating lasting value. For this reason, our economy and society as a whole has an interest in making sure that executive pay is truly aligned with sustainable risk-adjusted performance. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon, including for your unique concision. Uh, up next, we're now three minutes ahead of the game. Uh, up next will be uh, Professor Jose Shankman from Professor of Economics at Princeton.
thank you. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'll talk about this paper that I've written with my colleague Harrison Hong at Princeton and our former student Ying Hao Cheng, who is now at the University of Michigan. Um, and in this paper, uh, we do two things. First, mm -hmm. we use a panel data on U.S. financial industry to document uh, that composition of top executives and risk taking are correlated in the cross section, which means firms that have that take uh, that pay their executives better take more risk or took more risk uh, in the past. Um, now, there's at least three reasons for which this 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 correlation may may appear. One of them is governance. You know, a lot of the top the discussion here has been around this misalignment between managers and shareholders' interests. That's one reason why they be, be they, that could be happening. But at least two other reasons which I find interesting. One is that it's really an investor's demand. Uh, risk taking as a result of shareholders with short horizons incentivizing managers to take short-term risk. With Patrick Bolton and Wei Shang, we done some work motivated by the, by the tech bubble, but which you, if it's translated in terms of what maybe we want to call the quant bubble, you know, the risk management bubble, that investors' demand for risk taking caused the firms to take the, this risk. The third possibility, which is kind of hard to disentangle for the first one, the hardest thing economists have to do ha have is to disentangle supply from demand, of course. It's a supply reason or firm culture. There are firms that have a culture of risk taking. Bear Stearns, of course, was the one that many people talk about. And investors' interest in short term risk, we just buy the stock of these companies. Um, now, I'm going to argue here that this correlation, the correlation we observe between risk-taking and, and compensation, is more likely to have come from some form of shareholder pressure or matching, as the hypothesis two or three, than from governance issues. You know. And, of course, causality and normative statements are more difficult to make, but it's important to establish at least some robust facts to inform the debate and policy. So. How do we do, how do we go around measuring this kind of measuring short termism or, or measuring compensation? We do use a different measure of compensation than what appears mostly in the literature. Um, first of all, what is not a big innovation, we look at the compensation of the top five executives. That's because that's easy, that's something we can find. Um, we have to control for firm size because better, larger firms typically attract better people and pay more and also to construct for different sub-industries in finance because insurance is not the same thing as banking, it's not the same thing as investment banking. Um, so we control for that. Now, one thing we do, we just, we look at total pay, okay? And here, I mean, I think Tano is the only uh, Chicago, former Chicago student I, rec I, re I recognize here, but I spent 20 years at the University of Chicago. And one of the things we're known for are those very difficult core exams at the end of the first year every PhD student has to take. And then the micro exam, invariably, every other year, there'll be a question whose correct answer is for students to realize that whether you give people money in one state of the world or give them money in general and take away in the complementary state of the world, does all the same things, okay? And this is like a very simple microeconomic point that sometimes gets forgotten even by, 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 by sophisticated economists. So that's why we, we try to, to drill them on, the, on that point, okay? So we're trying to, to do two things, to pick up not only the short-term short pressure and firing incentives, and that's the point I was going to make, also trying to pick up you know, uh, the firm-wide compensation practice. You know, we know that certain firms, for instance, AIG, um, CEO, the CEO is not really the most important person determining risk-taking. Um, also, the other thing we do is the control for insider ownership in the spirit of the work that Rene has done with a co-author. Let me talk a little bit about the empirical design. We start with data and compensation. It comes from ExecuCom and several sources of risk taking. Now, ExecuCom really starts in 92, so we can't go beha before that. And there are several ways of doing. We do it in different ways, but most, I think the most compelling way and the one I'm going to present today is when I pull the data in, in two periods. One I call the early sample. In the early sample, I'm going to look at compensation practices between 92 and 94, and then look at risk taking in the period 95, 2000, just before the explosion of the tech bubble. 
And then your late sample, which, which we want to look at the rest of the period, which is 2000 and 2007, and by symmetry, we look at compensation in the three years prior to that period. Now, the other thing we do is classify financial firms. We look at them in three different groups. Uh, the first of all, what we call primary dealers, and that includes bank holding companies with primary dealer subsidiaries. The second one is all the other types of other banks, lenders, and bank holding companies with no primary dealer subsidiary. And finally, certain types of insurers, mainly casualty and churn insurers, and fire and marine. Now, if you look at residual compensation in 92, 94, for instance, or if you look in 98, 2000, you kind of see three lines here. The blue line corresponds to banks, the red line corresponds to, to insurance companies, and the black line corresponds to the broker dealers. You can see the broker dealers pay more money, uh, that's for sure. On the horizontal axis, you have the size. The bigger companies, of course, pay more in whatever industry they are. Um, and you can see some outliers already in this graph. The red, uh, the AIG is out there, is way above the red line. MBI, which was on the monoline insurance, is way above the red line. And then you see the, the C for city uh, is above the black line, and Bear Stearns above, is above, above the black line, too. So thing to understand is this, this rank of residual compensation. So we create a residual compensation measure, which basically adjusts for these lines. Okay, so Citibank will be the difference between where city is and what would be predicted by the black line for its size and so on and so on. And what you find out is that residual compensation is very stable. The firms that paid a lot of money in the first period, 92, 94, are also paying a lot of money in 98, 2000. There's absolutely no effect to how well the firms did, very little effect, and whether or not the CEO was fired, and which uh, none, none of that seems to, to, to have uh, to play a role. Now, we want to correlate that to some measure riskiness. And in the paper, we go through several measure riskiness. The ones I like more are the mar market-based measures risk riskiness as opposed to book-based because, as we know, Citibank, of course, had, didn't have a lot of book risk because it was all in the sieves that we were guaranteeing on the other side. So the market-based uh, measures work better. And um, there are three of them, at least, that we consider the sensitivity to the, the ABX index. The ABX index was an index of AAA mortgages, um, mortgage products. Um, the beta of, the, of, 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 of these institutions, and also the return volatility. And one of the nicest things is to, I think, is to look at some kind of average price-based risk score. For those of you who are aficionados of those things, that corresponds to the first principal component, but that isn't really, doesn't really matter. You simply average the three uh, price-based risk scores, you normalize them, and then average, and you can see a very clear positive correlation between uh, how much residual compensation these firms paid, and also the, the amount of risk they took. Uh, if you want to think of an economic significance, a one standard deviation residual compensation gives you half a standard deviation on this risk score. So it's quite a strong economic relationship to it. Now, if you look at performance, you see another story, and that's where the title of the papers come. come. Firms that paid a lot of money did very well in the past, and the same firms that paid a lot of money did very badly in the last period. That's the yes, the hero story. So residual compensation seems to predict performance. S it doesn't seem to predict performance per se. It actually predicts how much you're going to be in the tails of the performance. Of course, the first period is a period of very good performance for everybody, and these firms tend to be do very well. The second period is a bad period for, for financial firms, and these firms that paid a lot do very badly. There's a lot of robustness uh, tests. I'll be willing to my time. There's a lot of robustness tests we go through in the paper. None of that is that important. Whether you can exclude CEOs, you can you can um, exclude different sub So you can see is this a phenomenon just of banks? Is just a phenomenon just of broker dealers? Is this a phenomenon just of, of insurance companies? And none of that seems to affect. Of course, it's strongest for broker dealers as you expect. The people are taking more risk and so on with the broker dealers, but the phenomenon is there for every one of them. You can control for insider ownership, and I Rene, we don't find much that insider ownership doesn't seem to matter for returns, for instance, so you, and, but it also, also doesn't seem to matter for risk taking. Now, I want to end up discussing this question between governance versus shareholder sh choices. Now, it may very well be that our governance measures, the one that we economists use, are not any good. That's a perfectly good good proposition, okay? I'll let people who propose those, those measures defend them. But in fact, they don't seem to correlate to residual compensation. 
better governed firms don't seem to pay less once you account for, for their size and their industry, or restaking or returns. So government doesn't do anything. Uh, on the other hand, high residual compensations and high risk-taking stocks also have high institutional ownership and high turnover. And why are we interested in this? Because the kind of theory of speculative investments that Patrick and I work with predicts exactly that. Okay? It predicts that the stocks that will be subject to, to more speculation have more turnover, because people will be buying and selling them in the short run, it's also going to be, they're going to be betting on the bubble in a sense. Okay. So it is consistent with this theory. Um, but it's also, of course, consistent on the fact that, well, maybe those firms are just like that. And investors who are interested in betting on, 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 on taking short-term risk choose them. It's very hard to differentiate between these two. Now, just to show you a picture of the turnover and excess compensation. So here at the, on the horizontal axis, you have the stock turnover. Rank, firms ranked by stock turnover, and on, 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 the, on, on the vertical axis, you have the residual compensation. And again, for both periods, you see that, and the effect is actually stronger in the second period when it's more likely there was a kind of a, a bubble going on, on stocks of financial firms. Now, I like very much this quote by Michael Lewis on the irresponsible investor, which I think fits a lot of the, what the evidence is coming, or the evidence here. It says the investor cares about short-term gains in stock prices a lot more than he does about the long-term viability of a company. And in that, and they end up by saying, and he's very good at letting corporate management know it. Those of us who have interacted with, 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 uh, with corporate managers, um, they all tell stories about the, the hedge fund managers who call them and say, if you do X, your stock, I just got a big position in your, in your company, and if you do X, your stock price is going to go up, so why don't you do X? So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. So let me summarize. There is evidence that high compensation related to high risk and tail performance. There is evidence that excessive risk taken by firms may have been a response to shareholders' demand. So the gov emphasis on governance may be misplaced. So if you're not going to do governance, what can you do? I mean, there are two things. First of all, what is it a problem? Yes, it is. We know it's a problem because when financial firms go under, it's not only their stockholders that suffer, we all suffer, we all pay for it. So, um, I think you went the other way, I think that's yeah. the one you want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I'm, always, I'm in my last slide. Uh, um, but it's also, so that's, so if it's the problem, I can think of two kinds of solutions. One of course is regulation, regulating the amount of risk those firms are allowed to take. The second, which is not a, it's not easy to implement, but it must, may, one may want to give some thought is allocating voting power according to holding horizons. Now, that's very hard to do. Uh, looking at the future, they're saying how much you have to hold your stock if you want to vote, but maybe you can do how much time you have held your stock that allows you to vote. So that's something that you could think of yeah. in terms of uh, that would have, would go with this, with this fact that I presented. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next up is Bruce Colgate of Columbia. be um, speaking in the uh, recognition that there are many papers uh, talking about compensation today. Um, so we have a bit of an ecology here. Uh, normally I actually uh, end up showing some uh, results from the colleagues uh, in the room, uh, including the really interesting uh, figures from uh, Renee's paper, uh, which shows that the most highly compensated people in the financial industry prior to, I think, 2007 or around that were uh, those who were in the uh, banks which had, or the financial institutions which had the greatest trouble for the five of the top actually uh, collapsed in this particular study. In some sense, Renee, without doing the regression or anything, that's the story we're, we're telling, is that in fact uh, it, this evidence seems to suggest in the last paper, our paper as well, that excessive risk uh, uh, through compensation uh, is an important factor and uh, does lead to these catastrophic outcomes we've seen in the last, uh, last crisis. The, um, having said this is the results, uh, let me just say something in general, uh, which um, uh, we're all 
we all take as obvious, uh, so let's just bring it out to the, to the table itself. You know, when you look, you know, I come from this industry, for having looked at other industries in the past. Uh, normally when you look at an industry and you say, I'm gonna maximize values, which Charlie brought up earlier, well, you actually have to attach some action to that. Uh, so you have to do something, you know. So if you're Apple, you put out an iPad um, strategy around that, you have to take a certain amount of risk, there's some investment behind that, um, and that becomes quite, uh, uh, you know, a, an aspect of the, of the oper operational risk, if you wish. Then there comes a financing risk after that. You know, do you borrow debt for this? How much debt do you actually do this? So there's kind of a series of actions which you, which you take. Um, what's, what's different about the finance industry is that the, 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 the strategies are actually based around the act of leverage. I mean, leverage is intrinsic to this industry. That's, that's how they make their money. Uh, so if you look at the interesting paper by uh, Hamid Moran and Patrick Bolton on our site, they'll, they'll show you how much astronomically more levered financial institutions are than other institutions it's because that's how the money is made. So there's going to be a tendency to move to that boundary condition, if you wish, the boundary being ex high risk in its operations because that's going to be very highly correlated with the profitability of the firm. The only issue is, is constrained by what, you know, and constraint is going to be something which normally is called prudent risk, which comes up, and that's something which Susan Bias talked about earlier, how well it actually uh, operates in this, uh, in this environment. Charlie was right in saying that it's hard to imagine that compensation in general drives these sort of results. I'd say in general. But when you're in the condition of an industry which is at that boundary, that very thin line, where you're so leveraged by the nature of your business that marginal differences off that risk choice you're making, we're gonna have very large impacts. Um, and I think that's what we saw. If you run the analysis which we all run during normal years, you're not gonna find these results. The results are driven by the outliers, outlier years, and also by the outlier firms. This is where you're gonna see the kind of stress test in real time. And the stress test is gonna show that those firms which are not properly managed, which went beyond that line, and those, fir and th and th those years are gonna do very, uh, very badly. So this is what we did together. My colleague here uh, is in the audience, uh, Sid Balachandran, and also we had a third uh, person on the paper, which is uh, Hitesh Harnell, who now works for, uh, for, for UBS, which bears no responsibilities for the, the, the catastrophe nor the results of this, uh, of this, of this paper. Um, I'm not gonna go through uh, much of this here. I'm just gonna show you what we did. So you already had Jose explain to you basically what he did to find some sort of measurement of risk. So we did something differently uh, on this. Uh, we took a, a standard model uh, which came out of the uh, 1970s uh, work by Black, Scholes, and, uh, and Merton. Got changed over time. Uh, th that original model, they would fix, a, they fix volatility so you don't take into effect the fact that volatility changes over time. That's extremely important in this, in this, in this industry, as reasons I've already said, and that as you get this you know, major changes in risk uh, uh, over uh, uh, you know, day by day, if you wish, and you have to take into account these particular uh, changes in risk. Computationally, this is a huge thing to do, so I was very lucky to have um, some uh, good help on, on computing these things. But we use basically a, a kind of option-based uh, model to back out some risk estimates using volatility which changes every time. Let me ask, add one, one more thing here which is interesting, I think, for us. And Susan Bice brought this up. And that is one of the odd things about this industry is that, is that the people matter an awful lot to this industry. And therefore, it's the tendency is to pay them a lot of money in order to attract them and to retain them. This is, this is what makes it even more complicated with the compensation side. So there's gonna be a tendency to attach their payments to these financial incentives of, of, of stock and, 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 and elsewhere. Oddly enough, there's a lot of failure in this industry, and maybe if we have time at the end or during the discussion, we can talk this kind of odd thing of why high profits and high failure rates in this industry, and there's a good reason why you find, you find both, okay? Let me shoot ahead. I'm gonna uh, sh uh, move to some, uh, some pictures, if, I wish, if you wish, to, uh, to look at what we did. So I told you we estimated the default ones. We use the default ones, we have some known data, we have equity data, we have liabilities data. Liabilities data is off the off the balance sheet, uh, changes every uh, three months, um, but for better or for worse, since these liabilities are, 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 are marked to the, uh, uh, to the market, um, uh, they reflect ongoing uh, uh, changes in the, uh, in the financial markets and give interest rates. It's a bunch of things you don't know, which you have to actually have to, you have to figure out. We use standard ways to figure them out, which is not 
easy actually to do in an implementation, but we come out with some sort of probability of default. This is what the thing, key thing we're, we're looking at. So we estimate the probability of default off these, off these models. A bank has a certain amount of assets. They go up and down. If things go well, the assets stay above uh, their, uh, net assets stay above their, their, um, their uh, debt, uh, debt book value. If things go badly, they're going to have a problem of, of uh, debt calling in the, the, uh, the, the firm, which is what this one over here uh, illustrates to you. As, as the asset values change, the market is amazingly intelligent with wonderful mathematics to back it up. To extract what the market actually feels is going to be the probability of that asset crossing that particular line. So it's, a, it's quite, a, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive if you wish. It may be horrifying to many people, but it's impressive that you can extract from the market these probabilities of, 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 of default. Um, we do this, this is for JP Morgan um, over time. Uh, uh, you may be a little bit surprised to see JP Morgan does go up and down a little bit in these probabilities, but you know, JP Morgan does things like acquire firms. And when you acquire, which is very common in the banking industry, which uh, Dr. Bice pointed out, and as you do so, you're, you're, the, the market reacts to those, uh, to those dangers, and you see it very well reflected over time. Um, and then towards the 2007 uh, period, you also see it have it go up, but you know, it went up uh, quite a bit, but it went up less than before, and, and it went up less, a lot less than the other uh, competitors in the, in the industry. This is for Wells Fargo, uh, generally uh, did well in this, uh, this period of time. Um, if you look at a company like Goldman Sachs, um, maybe it's good to remember Goldman Sachs, and I think you're absolutely right uh, uh, to praise uh, uh, Goldman Sachs for its risk management, but it does risk management so we can move almost you know, to the maximum point of that boundary. So it's just at that boundary, and, and you know, should the wind be blowing that, that day the wrong way, things, uh, things get tough, and the wind was blowing a little bit wrong in, that, uh, in, those, uh, in, those, in those days. Excellent management, but also extremely aggressive in terms of their strategies in this in this, uh, in this marketplace. And you can pick this up very well in the, in the data. Um, you want to see how good we're doing. We actually then, for the banks which we have data for, we correlate this with the CDS uh, uh, inferred uh, probabilities of default, and they correlate extremely high as well. We don't have this for the 117 banks we have. We have about for 50, but we get some validation on, on how good this measure is. This is probably is the most, most interesting plot we have. Um, uh, it probably doesn't mean first to uh, too much besides the the aesthetic value of seeing dots uh, scattered across uh, two dimensions. Um, but it's kind of, you know, one of the issues which Jose's paper mentioned and we also looked at was whether or not these banks have a culture of risk. You know, are there certain ones which look, uh, look like they're going to be high risk ones? Overall, there's a short term autocorrelation, you know, of, of this. So year to year you, you find this. But generally, you don't find this lasting very long term. The accept, ex major exception would be, I'd say Lehman Brothers, uh, which shows up three times in this. So we took, we took, the, we took the square in the upper right-hand corner of this one, and we just blew it up uh, over here on the right-hand side, uh, a graph. And Lehman Brothers clearly com comes up three times in this, uh, over the years as being rather high in terms of, uh, of the market saying this has a high probability of default. And there's nothing I've heard from anyone who's worked for Lehman Brothers or anyone who's analyzed Lehman, Lehman Brothers to make me think that it's wrong to say this was a very high risk uh, company with a very strong culture of, of risk. But generally, we don't find this overall. Let me go back to Charlie's point. In this industry, one of the hard things is that the average behavior doesn't really give you all the information. It's really the extreme behavior which matters. So the fact that only one firm does this uh, doesn't mean that pro there's no problem. In fact, the problem is still there from a regulator's perspective. Um, so you find this in the data, the data itself. Um, you know, Jack, you're a lawyer on this. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, from a lawyer's perspective, it doesn't really matter if we're, av if we're honest on average. Uh, what you're interested in is really what the criminal does uh, on that one. Um, so, uh, and I've never, never seen a criminal excused for criminal activity because on average, the rest of the population is pretty, uh, is pretty honest. So these extremes actually do matter a lot to these, uh, to these outcomes. Um, we do a bunch of stuff, which uh, uh, I'm going to leave, uh, spare you from how we exactly do it. Um, but we use um, some econometrics, which are hard. Uh, reference was made, do you actually believe your econometrics? Um, I often don't. Um, so there's some things which I look for to make sure they work. One, does the simple model work? Uh, so the simple model, in our case, does work. So that's kind of good news. If you make it more complicated, does it still work? It still works in our case as you make it more, uh, more complicated. 
Um, does governance matter? It's hard to figure out exactly whether it's governance or, or uh, executive pay. Um, good governance should, has, should have good executive pay policies. What we can say is that when you look at the two of them together, governance doesn't seem to matter an awful, an awful much. It seems to be that pay is doing the same thing. And it's nice to hear that Jose had the same, the same result. Um, I would like to say that, 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 uh, uh, that I also don't like the governance measures very much. And I think it's probably just very noisy data, whereas the executive comp data is better, is, uh, is better data. And that perhaps explains some of these results uh, as well. Um, it works in both directions. Pay, which is option-based, tends to be, tend, will lead you to more excessive risks. Pay, which is more based on cash payments, will lead you to, uh, to less excessive risk. Uh, so it works in both directions. Uh, you drop outliers, you drop years. Uh, if you drop 2008, the results aren't not as good any, any longer. Stress tests do matter to this particular uh, result. Um, and we do a bunch of other stuff to uh, try to test whether it matters, including getting rid of these 5% uh, of, the, of the extreme values for, uh, for risk. Okay? So basically, this is the econometrics which we, which we used. I think from my perspective, and since I'm not invested in any particular theory, and I would have been happy to have any, any significant result possible. I just didn't want to have no significant results. So I was, you know, I was happily, you know, either way would have been fine, been fine with me on this, uh, on this one. Um, you know, what I'm a little puzzled by, and I just take my puzzles uh, on this, um, is that you're absolutely right. You use paper by uh, 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 Lucien and, uh, and Holger and uh, other people looking at how much cash out there was, and there was a tremendous amount of cash out. Um, I talked to a guy at Columbia. Business schools is always great. I know this is amazing, Bernard, to other people who don't hang around these people too much. But they pass through. And this guy lost, you know, like he lost $100 million on, on Lehman, um, but he's doing just fine, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, every, you know and part of the news is, is it's just relative, you know. I mean, what does it matter? What's the incentive property of an extra $5 million, $10 million when you're already substantially wealthy uh, on this? Um, and I suspect, to be honest with you, that uh, when you're talking about such high levels of compensation, uh, we're no longer talking about the incentive for doing X or how much more you can motivate people. Um, because the truth is, you can't, there's only 24 hours in a day. And you know, no matter what the option price is, that there's not going to be a 25th hour in that particular day. And they're, they're highly compensated. So I think there is a story, going back to this, about you know, a behavioral story, if you wish, about what's going on. And maybe it's linked to bubbles and how they're created and the overconfidence which is behind that. Or maybe it's just people look right and they say, who else is being paid in this? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure, Lucien, if it's board capture, which explains this, this, whole, this whole thing. I know you'll, you'll push this one. Um, but I don't think the standard model which we look at in terms of why we need to compensate people so highly in order to get them to work harder is the one which is going to end up as being the correct one for these particular results. Thanks very much. Now, Patrick Bolton of Columbia. Thank you, Jack. Um, so, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Hamid Meran, uh, who's sitting over there and uh, with uh, Joel Shapiro from uh, Oxford University. And um, so in this work, um, or um, no, work in progress, um, we do two things. One is we're trying to um, zero in on the mechanism that links executive compensation to risk taking. And then second, uh, to um, go in the direction of uh, what uh, uh, Brandon Rees was uh, um, asking for, we propose a way of, uh, and this is going to be a bit of a mouthful, uh, but uh, <laughs> that's what he said, um, we, we propose a way of adjusting pay for performance for risk. So uh, that's mm -hmm. the program here. So before I start, let me just tell you again, I think it's always useful to remind ourselves how we got to current pay practice. Uh, and um, you know, the best um, articulation of the foundation, you know, the, the, the conceptual foundation for current executive pay practice is uh, in this paper by Holmstrom and Tirol. 
Um, and what do they say? They say, well, stock price, first of all, is a good measure of <coughs> fundamental value of the firm, long-term fundamental value of the firm. So to the extent that you want to encourage CEOs to maximize long-term fundamental value, you want them to be, their pay, to be sensitive to um, stock price, right? We all, we all know that. There are a lot of caveats, though, to this uh, basic um, theory or uh, you know, uh, uh, um, foundation of executive pay that we all have taken uh, on board. First of all, um, their, uh, their model doesn't allow for leverage. Um, it doesn't allow for stock options. Uh, there's no endogenous choice of risk or volatility. Um, there are complete markets, which means that um, uh, essentially we're talking about uh, shareholders being risk neutral, so they don't care about risk. And there are no speculative bubbles. Okay, so that's a serious limitation for the, um, the concept. So in, uh, Jose already mentioned our earlier work that we did uh, um, trying to relax some of these assumptions and uh, um, where we allow for uh, deviations of stock price from fundamental value. That is, we allow for bubbles. And when you have bubbles, incentives change. And if you make a uh, uh, compensation based on stock price, you're going to have very different behavior. And we show that basically have much more short-term misbehavior, as Brandon was highlighting. And this short-term misbehavior takes the form of excess risk-taking. Okay? And uh, there's some uh, work I should mention also by uh, Lin Peng, who's sitting over there, uh, who are related to this, that uh, emphasizes uh, earnings manipulation, which is another angle which I don't have time to go into. Um, so let me move on in the interest of time and then come to compensation in the banking industry where we're talking about highly levered institutions. Um, and so let me unpack a little bit why uh, for those institutions, you know, the, the uh, lever uh, leverage angle, why we should expect uh, stock-based compensation to lead to excess risk taking. Um, so we build a little model, which I'm not going to go into, but I'll, I'll give you the basic idea. Uh, um, so we know that uh, once you have a levered institution, equity is like a call option. And when you have a call option, you maximize, if someone made that point before, you maximize the value of that call option by maximizing volatility. So that's a very basic mechanism. That's easily understood. Now what goes against that, though, is if you're a CEO of a bank, um, and you would like to raise debt. Well, no, the market isn't stupid. The bond market understands that you may have excess risk-taking incentives, and that will then be priced into the bonds. So you actually want to tell the bond market, I'm not gonna take more risk to get lower cost of capital, okay? So if you can do that, then a lot of things uh, work well. The problem, though, is it's very difficult to do that. First of all, how much risk you take is very difficult to observe. So you can't commit to <coughs> bondholders, to your debt market, so you're not going to take too much risk. Um, the incentive scheme you're under as a CEO is hard to verify. Now, we've made progress on that, and we're actually using some of that in our empirical analysis. So that's going to be one constraint. The other uh, aspect that's going to make you uh, uh, bad at um, uh, controlling risk through compensation uh, is that you have distorted incentives as a shareholder. So this is the limits of say on pay. So first of all, uh, you know, deposit insurance provides a subsidy to banks and you may want to take advantage of that. That will lead to excess risk taking. Secondly, uh, investors may have misperceptions of risk or they may feel there's an implicit guarantee or anything like that. So then your debt is cheap, so then you want to take more risk, okay? So that's the that limits on, say, on pay here. So, uh, well, so much for uh, my basic formula here. <laughs> but maybe this is, how, this is how you feel, this is how you feel in your heads, uh, so I'm gonna have to explain to you. This is, uh, this is PowerPoint, by the way. This is, uh, this is Microsoft, uh, you know. This is not, uh, so I have, it on my, I, have, I have it on my laptop, but I, you know, I forgot that sometimes this is, um, So what's that basic idea? How do you adjust 
How do you adjust pay for performance for risk? Okay, so it's the basic idea we want to propose. It's a simple idea. It doesn't work for every, every firm. It works for the largest firm. And it's an easily implementable idea. And that's what I want to plant uh, uh, today, uh, uh, th th that idea. What you do is you don't just base compensation on stock price, as we always do. You also base compensation of CEOs on CDS spreads. CDS spreads or deviations from an average are going to pick up the market's perception of how much risk the bank is taking. Those numbers are out there. It's very easy to write a compensation contract that uh, is based on CDS spread. So if the CDS spread goes up, you pay your CEO less. It's as simple as that. So what we show in the paper is you can actually achieve optimal risk taking by choosing the right weights on stock-based compensation versus uh, CDS-based uh, compensation. And then we have a, a small empirical part uh, um, that um, suggests that indeed CDS spreads do pick up uh, uh, market's perception of how, how much risk the bank is taking. And not just that, the market picks up um, the incentives of the CEOs to take risk. And the way we look at that is we, 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 we do a, a small event study uh, that exploits a, a new disclosure requirements for executive compensation, uh, um, which, uh, you know, there's more, you have to disclose the deferred compensation, pensions and, and, and the like. And what you find is that, of course, the more deferred the compensation is, the more pension uh, 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 compensation there is, um, the less likely the CEO will be to want to take risk, right? Because then this is the money that's on the line. And not surprisingly, you do find that in the data that the more, the, the, the bigger the weight of compensation on, uh, on, you know, on deferral and pension, the lower the CDS spreads. So let me conclude uh, and, and repeat what we do in this paper. So we, we unpack the mechanism for why risk taking increases uh, uh, with leverage and with, with uh, uh, executive compensation. We explain why say on pay is not going to fix things. Okay, and this is consistent with the earlier uh, studies. And we propose a very simple mechanism which would work for the, you know, uh, most of the largest firms. Just base uh, pay on CDS spreads. Thank you. Thank you.